Hey everyone, John Fraser here. It's been a while since I've uploaded a video, and that's because I'm working on a couple interesting projects that are taking a long time. But rather than letting the channel sit dormant, I thought I'd make a quick little project in the meantime. I'd like to make a reproduction of a type of ancient artifact that I haven't been able to get off my mind since I first saw one in a phenomenal video lecture by Irving Finkel, which I'll link to below. They're called wax tablets, and they're a sort of infinitely reusable ancient notebook. They come from all across the world. Here's one depicted in ancient Greek red on black pottery from around 500 BC. Here's another, this time a handheld variety, in the hands of a Roman woman on a fresco in Pompeii. Most are made of wood, which is where I'll start with mine. However, many are also made of ivory like the Assyrian one from Irving Finkel's lecture. Rather than making one particular artifact, I'm going to combine elements from a few. My primary inspiration comes from these Coptic examples from Egypt during the Byzantine period. Though this artifact has multiple tablets, I'm going to just make a pair, known as a diptych in Greek, which as far as I can tell is the more common style. I'm going to plane the wood down to about half an inch thick, to match the Coptic tablets, and then carve out shallow trays to cast molten wax into. Once the wax solidifies, it will be the writing surface that the user can inscribe with a stylus. These first steps are all about just getting the tablets down to size. What size that is is more or less up to me, as the artifacts come in a huge range of sizes. Some very large, more akin to panels, others surprisingly tiny, small enough to fit in a pocket. Mine is just going to be a little more narrow than the Coptic tablets, and a few inches shorter, to try to mimic the size of the Roman woman's tablet in the Pompeii fresco. The wide variation in size raises questions about the tablet's function. The exact purpose of these tablets varies artifact to artifact. What makes the wax tablet so useful is its reusability. You don't need to dedicate expensive resources like paper to whatever it is you want to write, which makes them especially useful for more casual writing. It's clear some really were notebooks, things people would just carry with them to write notes, calculations perhaps, to sketch, keep accounts, or other typical daily things depending on the user's profession. However, others were less casual and clearly had specific purposes. Many were used in the Roman period to teach students to write. A particularly ornate French example from the 1300s has religious imagery built in and was likely meant for a devotional practice of writing and reciting prayers. Along with this, just because they could be erased doesn't mean they needed to be. And as Finkel points out in his lecture, many wax tablets filled with writing would have been kept in libraries as texts, along with scrolls and clay tablets of a more permanent nature. The one at the British Museum, which still has fragments of wax covered in cuneiform writing, has been identified as an astrological text. With the tablet sized, it's time to chisel out the trays. To be totally honest, I don't know how deep to make these. The dimension of the inside of the tray is almost never included on museum's write-ups, so I'm just going to go down half the depth of the wood itself, which is probably much deeper than necessary. Chiseling out trays like this may well be one of the oldest forms of woodworking. As Dr. James Dilly has recently shown on his channel, Ancient Craft UK, in his series on Must Farm artifacts, which I'll link to below, very early on, Boxes and containers were frequently made by gouging and chiseling from a solid block rather than assembling a box from panels, as we typically do today. Such things vary place to place and time to time, of course, but it's safe to say routing is one of the oldest woodworking techniques there is. One of the things that interests me most about the wax tablet is its portability. 
The wooden trays make for convenient carrying cases, and the small size of many examples lends to being tossed in a satchel or otherwise carried with the owner as a readily accessible way to write notes or whatever the day calls for, much in the same way that it's convenient to have a way to take notes on your phone. In the medieval period, this portability concept really took off, and artisans and craftspeople began to incorporate more and more devices into the wax tablet to expand its utility. Some examples include, of all things, fold-out sundials and compasses, such that wherever you are, you have the time of day on you. The compass was undoubtedly just meant to help align the sundial, but I can't help but think of it as the medieval equivalent of having location services enabled. With the tablet frames mostly in shape, I'm going to give the wood a dark iron tannate stain, starting by enriching the light wood in oak tannins. I like the dark weathered look of the Coptic tablet, so I thought I would try to emulate it. Once a couple coats of tannins have soaked in and dried, I coat the wood in iron acetate, which will react to form iron tannate within the wood. This iron tannate complex is the pigment compound responsible for making ebony black, and should make the wood much darker. However, this reaction is slow, and the wood will continue to darken even after I publish this video. I should say, I forgot to wear gloves while doing this, which was a careless mistake on my part. Luckily, it's not a huge deal with this particular compound, but these organic complexes can easily absorb through the skin, and you want to avoid touching them before they're properly dried and sealed. With a copper compound, this could have easily made me sick, and even just with iron, my fingertips were dyed black for a couple days. Once dry, I applied a couple layers of boiled linseed oil to bring out the finish. Now, I'm going to shift gears to making the hinges that will hold the frames together. Many tablets have simple curd hinges, but the walls of mine are too thin for that, so I thought I'd experiment with a new material to me. This is a tegua nut, commonly referred to as vegetable ivory. As many tablets were either made of ivory or had ivory accents, I thought it would be fun to try to make a set of hinges with this. The tegua nut is very hard, much like stone, but it can be carved and has a slight flexibility to it similar to ivory. What I like most is that when freshly cut, it smells like almond cookies. I'm going to try to make a double hinge so I can fold the tablets all the way over on themselves, but I've never used this material before, so I'm not sure what to expect. I cut a test bracket and decided to test it to see how brittle it was by putting it on the anvil and hitting it over the edge to try to shear it in half. My hammer just bounced off, so it seems to me like it's more than strong enough to make a hinge. I have to say, I really like the Tegua Ivory. It's a very fun material to work with. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at working it just yet, and my hinges are a little lackluster. That said, I think I'll keep looking out for excuses to use this stuff, as I think it's as beautiful as it is fun to work with, and I really can't believe this stuff is actually made of nut. With the hinges in place, the frame is done, and the last thing we need before filling the tablet with wax is a stylus to write with. I'm going to make mine to match the tablet, and I'll build it with the same materials I used to make the tablet itself, namely wood, tegua ivory, and copper. The writing that remains on various tablets is of different sizes and depths, coming from the wide variety of styluses used in different writing techniques. The Assyrian cuneiform tablets have by far the smallest writing I've seen from the tablets I've looked at, which makes sense given how the language lends itself beautifully to being carved. To carve such small letters, a sharp stylus would be necessary. Because I'd like to be able to make the most of my limited tablet space, I figured I'd try to make my stylus tip as sharp as I could. That said, a more blunt stylus would be much more legible at the expense of requiring larger lettering. Though the erasability of the tablet that makes it reusable is one of its most crucial advantages as a writing tool, it also has the unfortunate consequence of meaning that a huge amount of historical text was simply erased. 
If you were a Roman, living in the right period, you might even send a letter to someone on a wax tablet, only to have them erase it and send their response back on the very same tablet. Because much of our understanding of history comes from piles of letters people have saved, the wax tablet can present a historiographical problem. In many ways, the tablet is a form of volatile memory. Anything written on it can be erased and lost. However, the humble stylus presents a solution, one that I frankly can't believe has actually worked. On some wax tablets, if the wax layer is sufficiently thin, writing with a pointed stylus actually indents the wood beneath the wax, leaving a sort of copy of whatever has been written on it. We can't normally read these minuscule scratches with the naked eye, but archaeologists and historians, in their unending and sometimes frankly unhinged devotion to prying into the personal lives of dead people and reading what they have written even after those people intentionally erased their writing, have figured out how to read through these indents with photographic techniques, even despite the fact that they'd have been written over time and time again and are often chaotic letter salads mingled with regular marks of wear and tear. Specifically, archaeologists and historians have reconstructed the text from some of 405 wax tablets found in a Roman archaeological site in London. These are known as the Bloomberg Tablets because of the Bloomberg Financial Building that has now been built over top of the site. The reconstruction of this text is a huge victory for history, and the knowledge we've gained from it really shows the benefit of such a devotion. When so little text has survived the ages, that we can recover some of what has been intentionally erased is really something to celebrate. A few drops of resin-based glue will hold the pieces of my stylus in place. The funny axe head shaped piece on the end is the eraser, which would smooth the wax, and could even be heated, sometimes just with the user's body heat, to help melt the wax just enough to squish it around. With that, it's finally time to melt some wax. I'm just going to be using some remnants of candle wax, modern paraffin, but back in the day, it certainly would have been beeswax. I'm melting the wax in my off-grid shop, so I'm using my spirit lamp. However, it's important to be extremely careful when heating wax, especially with an open flame. We just want to melt it, never boil it. It doesn't need to be heated long at all, and after extinguishing the lamp, I let the residual heat of the pot melt most of the wax. Because this is mostly white wax, I added some hematite, iron oxide, to color it blood red. Molten wax soaks up pigments just like magic, and I added way more than necessary just because I was a little hypnotized by watching it vanish into the molten wax. After the wax has been left to cool, I can finally start writing on it. It took me an evening of playing around with it to get used to using it, and I have to say, though I liked the Tagua hinges, they were getting in the way, and I ended up just taking them off and replacing them with simple leather straps, which I adhered with a little wood glue and some copper staples. I think I like it better this way, but tell me below which look you prefer. Otherwise, I'm pretty happy with it, and I'm ready to put it to use. It might be one of my favorite objects just as far as how it feels in the hand. I was worried it would be hard to read the inscribed letters, and small letters are certainly easily obscured. But I found as long as the light source is behind you and aligned with the tablet as to not cast shadows, you can read it more or less as easily as words on paper, at least in person. Even though there's plenty about this that I would have done differently if I could do it again, I, I'm still very pleased as a whole of how this has turned out, and even though I know I just made it yesterday in my workshop, it genuinely feels to me like something that 
would have been held by someone a very long time ago. Um, and there's good reason for that, right? I sized this to artifact examples, and it is, you know, a fairly straightforward object that somebody would have held a long time ago. And there's something interesting to that, you know, there's things with projects like like these that you expect, right? You expect the feel of the polished wood, you expect uh, the sense of the linseed oil, that sort of thing. But there's other things that you sort of just get, like this. I like this. You hear that clack? That clack meant something to somebody, right? That, you know, back when this was, you know, used in schools, back when this was what people carried around with them everywhere, that clack would have a meaning to it, right? Uh, that might be the sound of class ending, or that might be the sound of the accountant finally leaving, right? Uh, just little bits of life that are, you know, even in an object that's displaced from its own time, can still sort of persist. Uh, I, I feel similarly with some of the oil lamps that I've made in the past on this channel, that, you know, a, a very common everyday object that, you know, was so common, so lodged in how things were done that you still see them, right? We still use our tablets and our phones for many of the same reasons we use, even our the stylus resembles so much of a modern pencil with the eraser on one end and the writing tip on the other, right? These things are still lodged in our culture after thousands of years. And um, there's just something about it that feels like, it doesn't feel like this has been made anew, it feels like it's just been drawn out of our sort of cultural memory, if you know what I mean. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. I'm excited to say the channel has just recently reached a thousand subscribers, which feels like a big milestone. It means the world to me that these videos are generating some interest, and seeing them increasingly embraced by the community has been exciting. You all are awesome, and make sharing these videos fun. If you've got any questions, comments, or corrections, please feel free to comment below. If you know someone who might enjoy this video, you'd be doing me a solid if you'd share it with them. Also. I think it might be fun to do some kind of little thousand subscriber celebration video or something, like a Q&A or a workshop tour or something like that. So let me know if that sounds interesting. Thanks again, and bye!